Yeah. They say the dating pool has pee in it. I it's say it's straight sewage. It's not in a pool. It's sewer. You're part of the pool, so you're part of the pee. All right? You're part of the sewer. What's up, y'all? So I was sent this video to kind of look at, and uh, I thought I would give my thoughts while I watch it. Uh, the video is by Breakbeat Media. It's called Wife Loses 100 Pounds and Then Cheats. Uh, my immediate thoughts are, y'all be careful with these, with these big girls. <laughs> be careful with these girls with low self-esteem. Be careful with these women who are playing a part that's not authentic to them. But yeah, let's, uh, let's watch it and I'll pause it periodically to give my thoughts as always. I feel like the narrative is always the man cheats yes. the man messed up we were having a conversation off camera and he was just like everybody that you talk to says well what did he do yeah what do you feel about that narrative unfortunately as a society we do not know how to conceptualize women as perpetrators and because we don't know how to conceptualize women as perpetrators we don't know how to hold women accountable in any tangible way just like he alluded to and she admitted with her infidelity the question still came up what did he do uh, some people explain it away by saying well men are the leaders and women are naturally the followers so if she messes up then he must have messed up to inspire her mess up or to give way to her mess up. And I think not only is that dishonest, but it's also kind of insulting to womanhood, right? It, it assumes that womanhood is immature innately. It assumes that womanhood is adolescent. And outside of the control or jurisdiction of a man, that womanhood would be unproductive, would be wrong, <laughs> you know, would be children. And I think we're going to have to pick a side, right? Because the whole concept of feminism and the fight for women's equality is that women are just as intellectually, emotionally, sometimes physically capable as men. But with some of these concessions that we have grown accustomed to giving to women, it still assumes that women are the intellectually inferior species. And that's why we can't even think of women being unfaithful. Right. Even though therapists or people who've actually carried out qualitative and quantitative research, it, it always shows that women cheat just as much, if not more, than men. Women tend to be more cerebral. Women tend to hide their tracks better. But again, the popular notion is that men are the only ones who are unfaithful and specifically black men. Like black men can't keep it in our pants at all. And, you know, I think one of the good things about the modern day and the city girl era and things like that and the shamelessness that we see is that women are being far more honest than their grandmothers. You know, a lot of times we like to romanticize the good old days as if your, your grandfather wasn't raising a child that wasn't his, as if your grandmother wasn't sleeping with the milkman. But the difference is, whereas back in the day, things were swept under the rug to save face and to keep the family name. These days, women are unapologetic. Women are bombastic. Women are shameless, right? So I think it's an opportunity for us as men to actually deal with the reality of who women are, as opposed to remaining in love with this fairy tale, this Puritan fairy tale of who, wish we, who we wish women were. Uh, so we met when I was about 19. Um, and he was just, he became my best friend. Yeah. We decided to get married a few years later. We got married very young. I was about 23 at the time. Got married very young and he was amazing. He was a great provider. He was a good friend and things were good. We had a baby, um, things were good until they weren't. In the playlist, Listen to Black Men, you'll see an interview that I did with Corey Jones. Uh, shout out to Corey Jones. And in that interview, he kind of recapped the aftermath of his first marriage. I put the video out is for one, because I wanted to shed light on the scenario in which of how it happened and how these things can happen to men too. You know, mm -hmm. most time you just see women talking about the stories, but you don't see men talking about the stories or what happened. And what I realized is, is way more men that dealt with it than I thought it was women. 
So Corey Jones is actually my age, young, really young dude, but he went semi-viral on YouTube. I think that video is almost at a million views right now um, for telling his story of his first marriage, which led to a, a divorce. And he talked about how they were college sweethearts. They were the ideal couple. They were black love. <laughs> and long story short, she cheated on him with their trainer. And basically, it got me thinking about ideals, right? A lot of times, unfortunately, as men, we are told stories about what women want. We are told stories about who women want us to be. And we're not told the nuances. We're not told that some women actually prefer tumultuous situations. Some women identify those situations as excitement, right? Some women, chaos is their norm. And it's unfortunate because, you know, they have a lot of work to do, you know. Um, they probably come from certain environments. They've probably experienced certain types of trauma. However, um, as men, it, it's not our job to be rehabilitation centers. I think you can prove yourself to a woman to a point, but this idea, this sadomasochistic idea that a lot of men have that um, your job is to constantly be proving yourself to a woman, uh, it usually leads to very bad outcomes. And I think that men should be a bit more critical of their relationships. Right, critical of the sustainability of their relationships. Like I've talked about, critical about if this woman is okay being bored. Right, if this woman is an attention whore, because very often that uh, overlaps with her being a whore whore. Right, and what might be keeping her humble might be her appearance. What might be keeping her humble might be her shyness or whatever the case may be. But at some point, whether in this case where she loses a lot of weight and gets her appearance together or just, you know, naturally with age, you just become more bombastic. Generally, you might be or you will be faced with a different person. And I think it's important that men, especially men who are interested in long term commitment, don't think about who you're marrying today. Think about who she's going to become. And the question you must answer is, are you okay with that? Are you equipped to handle that? Because unfortunately, a lot of us as men, we just bury our heads in the sand. And because we're idealistic and because we want to do the right thing and check off the right boxes and make our mama proud and, and things like that, a lot of times it ends up, it ends up with us being victims to hurt people who inevitably hurt us. So I lost 130 pounds and kind of lost my mind, so to speak. But you lost 130 pounds in the relationship? In the relationship. When we got married, I was 320 pounds at my heaviest. And um, yeah, I lost the weight and kind of went south. Was this the first time that you ever been slimmer and like? Yes, all my life I've been fat girl. Mm. So this was the first time that I actually got to be the it girl, mm. so to speak, you know. And what about your husband? He, what about him? You mean like? Weight wise, was he? Oh, well, he was a bigger guy, but not, it wasn't too crazy at mm. the time. Um, he was a bigger guy, but he loved me big. He, mm. he never complained. He always complimented me, treated me like I was beautiful, but I didn't feel beautiful. There's a very important conversation about body positivity here. I've been saying for a long time that body positivity is a lie, primarily because it doesn't cut both ways, primarily because it's inconsistent with science and medicine, and primarily because even those women who are celebrated, for, for example, Lizzo, for being big, um, if you were to say to a, another woman, you look like Lizzo, they would take it as an insult, which lets you know 
that despite the cognitive dissonance of body positivity, beautiful at any size, BBW, they innately, inherently know that it's not right. They know that it's not healthy. They know that it's not good. However, because at the time they might feel disempowered to do anything about it, or they might, you know, be struggling with some mental effects of being obese, morbidly obese, um, they would rather live in this cognitive dissonance, defensiveness versus admitting that, you know, I have a problem and it is a problem. It is not a good thing. It is a bad thing. Right. And um, it's unfortunate that some of us as men have also been convinced that that aesthetic is an ideal. Right. Sometimes you'll hear people uh, tell the lie that back in Africa, you know, women were bigger and this, this and that. That's a lie. Google pictures. I'm Nigerian. You can Google pictures of Nigerians in the 60s or uh, the, the 40s or go back even during colonialism. That wasn't ever the norm. Same with America. Google pictures of women in the 60s, 50s, 40s during slavery. Being morbidly obese was never the norm, right? So these men who claim to have that as their preference, um, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance happening there, right? And sometimes maybe it's your preference because those women with their lower self-esteem are harder to knock down or easier, I'm sorry, to knock down. Maybe it's because those women tend to be more sexually promiscuous because they have to overcompensate for their lack of universal attractiveness. And over time, you've been led to believe that your preference is a 300 pound woman, when the reality is they're easier. And now we're regurgitating the, the lie, 300 pound women think they're beautiful, when deep down they know they're not. And then men think that, oh, that's my preference even though there is a lot of sadomasochism attached to it, a lot of low male low self-esteem attached to it. Because guess what? When men rise the ranks, when men are at the top of their game, when men are leaders, they're not passing up supermodels and objectively beautiful women for women who are twice their size. That's just not happening at scale. And as a commu community in particular, it's, it's time we start telling the truth about that. And unfortunately, you know, there's this other lie of we, you know, it was inherited. No, what was inherited were the habits of your parents. Your mom ate like shit. She taught you to eat like shit. Now you eat like shit and circulate the lie that, oh, my family's big boned. No, y'all aren't big boned. Y'all are just accustomed to eating like shit accustomed to no movement, accustomed to perpetuating lies. And whether you use Monique's Fat Girls, where a Nigerian man was in love with her specifically because she was twice his size, or the fact that you can find a man to sleep with you because you're easier to sleep with because of your low, low self-esteem, it, it keeps you in this cycle of putting off what you know is better for you. Not just better for your body, better for your heart. Literally and figuratively. This is a narrative about big women, right? One of the narratives that I hear is that big women know how to treat a man, right? It's just sort of because, I don't know, like maybe the world isn't at their feet. Yeah. Maybe they do have to be humble and yeah. display humility to have people like them or be into them or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of. So from the big girl perspective, can you speak to that? Well, not really, because he was obsessed with me. I mean, when I say in a healthy way, he loved me deeply and he and I never felt like I had to do a lot to keep him around. He always wanted to be around. So he worshiped the ground you walked on. Mm -hmm. What made you lose the weight? I was just tired of feeling that way. Yeah. I just I was tired of feeling how I felt. So I yeah. wanted to get it done. I was, I was speaking to someone that used to be fat and they be they're a fitness person now. Mm -hmm. And which one of the things she said to me was. There's not a fat person that isn't depressed. I can agree with that. I was very depressed when I was at that weight. Very, even throughout my marriage. One of the things I tell brothers 
it's next to impossible to love somebody who does not love themselves. And I realize it sounds cliche, but the reality is when somebody doesn't like themselves, love themselves, it's really difficult for them to conceptualize why they might be liked or loved by somebody else. And in some situations, they actually sabotage the love that they receive from somebody else because they might feel or they do feel unworthy of it. All right. So they'll either sabotage it and ruin it or they'll harbor a deep distrust of the person loving them because they can't believe how somebody could love them. Like deeply, they cannot conceptualize how somebody can love them when they don't love them. Right. So not to say it's impossible, but it should be a reason to pause. It's definitely worth a conversation if you are a man who is with or seeking out a woman who is not okay with herself. It doesn't always play out with infidelity. It doesn't always play out with sabotage, but it's definitely worth a conversation. And the thing is, just like she said, a lot of people in general, not just obese people, but people in general are depressed. Right. Depression is a real thing. It's it's a it's an epidemic now, especially in the West. And because of that, it kind of reshapes how we think, how we think about ourselves, think about the world, think about what we deserve, think about discipline or honor or integrity. And I think it's what leads some some people to go this low. And what you, what you see, just like, you know, with the picture of her ex-husband, he was big too. So there's a chance that either subconsciously he knew that that's the caliber of woman that he qualified for. She knew that that's the caliber of man she qualified for. So when that was no longer the case, she took, <laughs> she took a business to South Beach, literally and figuratively. Right. And I think it's it's part of the reason, you know, we, we have the conversation about when he get on, he leave your ass for a white girl or uh, men who make it. They leave the woman who held them down, kind of like Derek Jackson, for the woman that he might not have been able to pull when he was nobody. Or a white woman or a supermodel, whatever the case may be. And the unfortunate reality is that person might have been the best that they could do at the time. And when that changed, when they changed, that person was no longer good enough. Right? When I was in high school, I was driving uh, uh, Toyota. But now that I'm a millionaire, will I necessarily be fulfilled driving a Toyota? Probably not. Again, that's why I think it's important not just for a man to conceptualize what kind of woman is she going to be down the line, but it's also important for both sides to conceptualize, can I keep up with who this person is becoming? Because if I can't, we might be unequally yoked at a certain point because forever is a longer time for us than it's ever been. Medicine is better. The world is more accessible. Social media is at our fingertips. So what our grandparents and their parents were able to do and lock it in for 50, 60, 70 years, I think it's much more difficult for us to do that now. So we have to be more practical in our approach. And even my ex-husband would reassure me and tell me, you're beautiful, don't worry. I still felt bad within myself. So he watches you lose this weight. But he loved you for who you were. Yeah. But you didn't love you for who you were. Exactly. Does he not diet with you? Does he not go to the gym with you? Does he not want to do all those things? Or he just sort of like... He just supported me. Right. Um, he was kind of comfortable where he was. And his main focus was just me and gotcha. supporting me. So his main focus... So his main focus was 
assisting you. Yes. And just supporting you and yes. being there for you. Yes, absolutely. I heard once that if you are looking up at a woman, it means she's looking down at you. There's a reason why women prefer men who are taller. There's a reason why women prefer men who are leaders. There's a reason why women gravitate to men that other women gravitate towards. Men of status. Now it's the whole six figures. Because if women desire to follow, they inevitably desire somebody that they can follow. They don't want somebody who's following them. And Psychax talks about this, and I think he puts it much more brilliantly than I can, but there is the adored and there is the adorer. And he makes the point that the more difficult job is to be the adored. Counterintuitive, but he makes the point that the more difficult job is to allow yourself to provide the other person their fairy tale, basically. Because it feels much better, ironically, to feel like you won to feel like you finally got the person of your dreams. So he makes the point to allow women to enjoy that feeling. And I assume that means you might be a bit more stoic. You might be a bit less enthusiastic as a man. You might be a a bit less head over heels and all the fairy tale stuff. But in doing so, you allow her to enjoy the pageantry of that. Because again, if you're looking up to her, it means she's looking down at you. And again, it's not a perfect science. It's not pretty. It's one of those counterintuitive truths, but I've also found it to be true. Women would rather be the adorer, not the adored. So where did it go wrong? When you lost that weight, you looked in the mirror and then you were just like, hold on. Do you think that he could have married that girl that lost 130 pounds? Honestly, probably not. Um, well, that he would even want to. Oh, I look pretty amazing. So he probably would have wanted to. <laughs> but um, I, I don't think he could have. Now thinking back, I don't think so. Mm-mm. Yeah. Do you think that he felt that when he looked at you? I think that he felt betrayal. How could you do this? And I met you at this weight. How could you lose this weight? and just totally change when I met you at this weight. Another counterintuitive truth is very often we frame men like him as victims and similarly women like the the female version of him. You know, I met you when you didn't have shit. Now that you you have something, you're going to. But the reality is, in some sense, you could also look at them as opportunists. You could also look at them as taking advantage. Like I said, some men who like big women, if they were to peel back the layers, it's because big women are easier to sleep with. Big women have lower self-esteem on average. Big women have to overcompensate for their lack of aesthetic beauty. And I think they're aware of that as well. They're aware of the fact that if I was better looking, nigga, I wouldn't be in your league. You couldn't pull me. If I was the bad bitch that I envisioned myself to be in my head, you couldn't pull me. This is why it's so important for your status and self-image as a man to be independent of a woman. She needs to know. (laughs) I might be pulling a book out of Future's Bible, but she needs to know that you could pull other good women, women and potentially other better women That's what keeps her honest. That's what keeps her feeling like she won. But if you're in a situation where a woman feels like she's doing you a favor, I only married you because I'm fat. And the dudes that I actually want, they can't see past me looking like this, but just wait. And then you want to cry wolf when the reality is you didn't do the work to deserve her to be, to feel like she's lucky to have you. You didn't have enough of a standard for yourself to not accept and be cool with her mediocrity. So how can she respect you? And oftentimes we talk about how American black men compared to the rest of the world are a lot more accommodating. It's a positive thing, right? Because it helps, uh, it helps us compete when we go overseas and things. Cause like we're nicer than the, 
Arabic man or the Colombian man and, and the whole nine. And we we're, we have more money than them and the whole nine. So it's a win-win. However, on the flip side, it's a bad thing because we're not taken seriously. There's a lot of nonsense that we accommodate because we've been trained to by our mothers <laughs> that other men wouldn't tolerate. And even to this day, you say anything about Black women not doing right or black women not looking right. It's, or your mama looked like that. Your mama was fat. So how dare you want somebody who isn't? Your mama was a single mother. How dare you want somebody who's not? So even society sees us as not being deserving of anything better than our mothers. And it's not until we say, no, I will not tolerate your low standards for yourself as my standards for myself. And I think it'll force women to respect that because they know I, I can't just come showing up any kind of way, looking any kind of way, talking any kind of way, acting any kind of way, and it'd be okay because they don't do that with white men. <laughs> you see black women with white men, they're, they're on their best behavior. Their diction is better. Their temperament is better until it's not if she's just that bad, but they're capable of it. But because we are so accommodating as black men, and we accept big bonedness and BBW and all that nonsense. We're calling obese women thick just because their obesity is, is held in her thighs and her upper body. And we're so pseudo sexual as a, as a community. It's perpetuating this cycle of distrust and ultimately disrespect. Because black women don't believe us. They don't think we know what beauty is. Because we'll sleep with anything. They don't think we know what a good woman is because we'll sleep with anything. And as a consequence, there's no incentive for them to change. I know I'm going to find some low self-esteem dude to marry me even though I'm 300 pounds. I know I'll find some low self-esteem dude to take me and my three kids in even though he has none. So fuck all that shit you talking about. And it's not until, as black men in particular, we draw a line in the sand and say that, no, this is unacceptable and we're going to vote with our attention and our validation before this stuff stops. Because they know, because in her case, she lost a hundred pounds and she leveled up because <laughs> her ex-husband deserved the 300 pound version of her, but he's not in the league of the 200 pound or 190 pound version of her. We can't be mad at her. You, th you think that he felt betrayal? I think that he did because he supported me. He was there for me when I was 320 pounds. But then when I lost the weight, I I was different. My behaviors were different. What do you mean? Um, I dressed differently. Um, I wore more fitting clothes. I started to go out a lot more with my girlfriends more than ever. Mm. Um, I started getting a lot of attention, a lot more attention from men. And I didn't know how to handle it. Mm. I just couldn't handle it. So I had weight loss surgery. So I didn't put in as much work. It's kind of similar to getting a BBL. You go in one day and you're, you don't have a desirable body mm. and then you come out and you do. With weight loss surgery, it's gradual, but it's, it's kind of quick when you lose the weight. You mm. lose the weight pretty quickly. I lost a hundred pounds in six months. At first, he kind of let it slide. Mm -hmm. He stayed at home with the baby. Um, I had a one-year-old at the time. And he stayed at home with the baby and he kind of let me do my thing. Yeah, at yeah. first. And then it was like, all right. And then he was like, okay, do you have to go out every weekend? Oh, he was out every weekend. And during the week sometimes. One of my problems with this narrative that marriage is the fix all, it's the remedy, it is the ultimate solution and validator of the kind and caliber of man or woman that you are is that it doesn't take into account the realities and the nuances of romantic relationships today. And I think nobody recognizes this better than younger people. No offense, but I think some brothers and sisters who champion marriage the way that they do are out of touch. The reason being is our generation, I'm, I'm a millennial, I'm 30. Our generation, unlike generations prior to us, are not willing to 
evaluate marriage based on longevity. Prior generations were. Uh, prior generations saw marriage as a validator. It, it made you official. But because of just the more brutal honesty of our generation, our men and our women, we're realizing that just because she's married don't mean she ain't a hoe. <laughs> Sometimes she became a hoe after she got married. And I'm sure this was true for prior generations as well, but they, you know, women back then were better liars. It was easier to conceal information. But today with social media, with the shamelessness epidemic, you know, we have to kind of deal with what things are. And the reality is everybody is not cut out to be a husband. Everybody is not cut out to be a wife. But because of this pseudo idealistic push for it, you end up in situations like this. She cared more about the attention than her marriage. She cared more about the attention and the fun and living her best life than her child. And we like to frame it as if she's an exception, she's the anomaly, but in the modern day, this is more common than we might like to admit. And it's one of the more valid reasons why younger men are not enthusiastic about marriage because we see clear as day women who do not want to be wives, at least not now. And a lot of times younger men are shamed by older men or older women, you know, as being cowards, even though the reality is, you know, we're just paying attention. And that's not to say that some women are not ready to be wives or some men aren't ready to be husbands, but this jump that used to be the norm is no longer sustainable. And this idea that at a certain age, you're supposed to be married. You're supposed to do right by her, despite who she is. Once you put that ring on her, she'll transform into a wife. Or once you walk down the aisle, you will transform into a husband. It is not true. And that's not to say we give up on marriage, but that's to say that we need to start being honest about these conversations. We need to start being honest about premarital counseling and actually evaluating if a mundane, predictable, quote unquote, boring lifestyle is what you want. Because when I hear some of these women talk about marriage to them is a blowout wedding and it's traveling and it's excitement every day, it tells me very quickly, you do not want to be married because that's not marriage. That's not even marriage to a man who can afford that because if he can afford that, he will be so busy to maintain his ability to afford that. So you won't even have access to him to be able to do all that all the time. But a woman who's talking like that is a woman who's immature. And a woman who really just needs to be out here dating. But again, because we're not having these conversations, men are just vilified as he didn't do right by her and this, this and that. When the reality is she wasn't ready to be a wife. And we see how it plays out, especially nowadays with exposés like this and some of the horror stories that we hear from men. We see how it plays out when a man forces marriage on a woman who does not want to be. She might even think she wants to be. But upon further investigation, you find out she wanted to be a princess for a day and have an extravagant wedding, but she did not want to be a wife. She still wanted to be outside. She still wanted to be going to Miami with her friends. She still wanted to be in the club. She still wanted every day to be this Dora the Explorer adventure. But she's not to the stage yet. She's not at the maturity level, at the disposition where like rainy days inside is cool. I understand he's busy. I can entertain myself. And again, with women who lack the self-esteem or lack the image, she probably wasn't even aware that she <laughs> liked to be outside like that because typically she is ashamed of her body. But if you really know how to investigate, you realize that, yeah, she's just a city girl in waiting. <laughs> she's just a bad bitch in waiting. And I'm just lucky God didn't give her an ass or I'm just lucky God didn't make her fine. But in the modern day where Dr. Miami could give her an ass, Dr. 90210 could make her fine. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. So, brothers, women can be idealistic and hoity-toity and fairy tale, but we cannot afford to be. And women as well, please start telling these young men the truth. Just because y'all have been dating, just because it's the next practical step does not mean you're ready to be a wife. And question your ideas of what marriage looks like. And if it actually works and if it's sustainable for any caliber of man, 
but more specifically, the caliber of man that you're with. And if it's not, reevaluate if this is the right time for y'all to take that step. Reevaluate if that's what you actually want. Or do you just want the validation of a ring? The validation of a day where you're the center of attention and you're a princess. The validation of being the one out of your friends or out of your family that somebody wifed up. I had just had a baby. I was about a year postpartum. Mm. And I was feeling, I mean, the weight was gone, but I was still feeling bad. I was feeling bored and frumpy. Mm. And I just wanted some excitement. And he and I became friends and it was innocent at first. And then it gradually started to progress into something a little more inappropriate each day. You know, I worked with this guy. Work husband. I had to see him. You know, he would walk me to my car if it was too dark at night, whatever. And we began to talk on the phone. It was over after that. I had never felt that way before in my life, ever. Like the excitement, the what I thought at the time was love. I had never felt that before, ever. I have never felt so more desired in my life, Mm. ever. And even though my husband, he was very uplifting, you're beautiful, you're this, but this was different. This was, not only did he tell me I was beautiful, but I actually felt it too. Mm. You know, when my husband would tell me, I'd be like, oh, whatever, you're supposed to say that. Mm -hmm. You know, the saying, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. That's bullshit. It's not what you say, it's how you say it and who is saying it. That who is saying it is the most vital piece. The the ugly guy at school or at the job says, you look beautiful today. You know, women think it's disgusting. But if the handsome guy says the same thing, she's flattered. Well, that's because she believes the handsome guy. That's because his evaluation holds more weight. Think about it like this. If a guy who's never been out of his town says to a woman, you're the most beautiful woman in the world. Eh. But if a man who's well-traveled, desirable, successful tells a woman, you're the most beautiful woman in the world, it's a lot more valid. That's the reality, guys. When you think back to like American Idol, for instance, People didn't come on the show to impress Randy or to impress Paula Abdul. They came on the show to impress Simon. Simon, who don't like nothing. If he thinks you can sing, you can sing. But again, part of the lie that a lot of brothers were told is that it's just about being nice to a woman, buying her flowers, checking off all the nice guy boxes, and it'll work out in your favor when the reality is, no, it's about who you are. How valuable is your time? Do you give it to her freely and willy nilly, but still expect her to value it? We realize people are more irresponsible with money that they didn't earn, right? That's why drug dealers are always in the strip club or in the club blowing money fast because they didn't really earn it. It comes quick, it goes quick. Same thing happens with attention. Same thing happens with validation. One of the things I take pride in is the fact that if I give somebody a compliment, they know that shit real. Because if they lips crusty, I'll tell them that too. (laughs) So part of the red pill rage that a lot of brothers feel is this idea that we were lied to. We were told one narrative about women, but we often find out in a traumatic way that it's not true. The truth is women want to feel like they want to. Women want to feel desired, but they want to desire as well. Women don't just want to feel like they're your trophy. They want to feel like you are theirs as well. And I'm assuming that that's what the weight loss, the new attention and this new guy afforded her, that her low standard having husband couldn't. And we will frame it as if she's a terrible person and this guy is just a victim. But it's a lot more complex than that. I was very scared because Mm. I had never stepped out in my relationship ever. Mm. So I was very, very scared, but I was willing to take the risk because that's how intense the relationship between us had got. It's interesting that you said I never stepped out in my relationship, but you were emotionally stepping out of your relationship Mm -hmm. and how we don't sort of factor that into like the the cheating aspect, which is probably the more dangerous thing that we could be doing, right? But I meant before him. Before him, I had never emotionally, I wasn't talking to anybody, never. 
Mm-hmm. When I met him, that's when it all started. The emotional cheating and then the physical cheating. Right. Yeah. Going back to the fact that women cheat just as much as men, if not more, it always starts emotional. It is a lie that women at scale are capable of having meaningless sex with men. It is a lie. That's not to say there are some women who are built like men. There are some women who are built like men and yeah, it's just a nut. But the overwhelming majority are still emotionally tied to their vagina. And it's for very good reason, right? They could uh, potentially die Uh, from childbirth. And childbirth is one of the major utilities of intercourse, right? So women are innately selective. And I think men know that, and that's why uh, it's almost an unforgivable thing of allowing another man access to a place, a sacred place that I thought I earned. I'll say that it can happen to anybody. In my situation, I don't think I've ever been cheated on, but I don't know. (laughs) That's how I'll put it. I do not think I've been cheated on, but I don't know. Because I have a healthy respect for women. Right, Nigeria will say, fear women. Women are cunning. (laughs) Women are cerebral. Women are elusive. So I don't put anything past Anybody. However, there are some telltale signs to kind of pay attention to. And a major telltale sign is when she's withdrawn emotionally. Because women want to believe the fairy tale. You hear all these stories of women who stuck by a dude who wasn't no good and had his kids and held him down when he was in jail and all kinds of stuff. Women are absolutely capable of that stuff. But if you're not her him, it becomes a chore. Women want the labor and the sacrifice that comes along with love as well, because she wants to feel like she wants something as well. So you brothers who believe the lie of love is about me making her life as easy as possible, sometimes that puts you in a trick position, a sugar daddy position, not a love position. You know, I I have been (laughs) in a position where I was... I was the other guy. And one of the things I can tell you is if a woman has two men, one man that she is her perfect self for, ideal self, primp and prim and proper, and one guy who she's brutally honest with and transparent with, the guy that she's transparent with is the one that she loves more. And part of the reason why a lot of the naive, idealistic brothers amongst us are the ones who are more likely to be cheated on is the fact that those men don't give women permission to be themselves. And if you repress yourself long enough, eventually anybody cracks. And that guy who allows her the opportunity to let her hair down, he's a shoe in She feels comfortable with him. And again, that's why I have a healthy fear of women, because you never know if you're that guy. There's some things to pay attention to. But ultimately, it's about not forcing her to live in your fairy tale. Well, it was exciting because it was a secret. Mm -hmm. But when I came home, I was just I loathed coming home. I did not want to come home. I wanted to be in that excitement, that euphoria forever. Mm. I hated coming home. Mm. Um, So it was hard. I lived a double life. I was a different person at work and with him. And I was a different person at home with my baby and with my ex-husband. It was hard. It was very exhausting, but it was so exciting Mm. and enchanting. And I did not want to stop. It became an addiction. Was sleeping with your husband difficult? Very. Why? Why? Because I only wanted the other guy. Wow. And at this time, is this other guy married? He was. I didn't know at the time. I just thought he had a living girlfriend. But it turns out that was his wife. Wow. Yeah. Did you find it easier to cheat with somebody that was with somebody? 
did that, or did you not care? You was just so enamored by this one individual. Well, I didn't care. Didn't I was care. so enamored. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't his wife, so I thought, so I thought I was okay. I'm like, whatever, it's just your baby mama, who cares? Mm -hmm. um, but I was a little jealous I, because there were times I wanted to be with him and I couldn't because he had someone else. I had way more freedom than him. Women are far more flexible and accommodating than we give them credit of being. Like I hear brothers who make excuses for why a girl they're interested in isn't accepting a date or isn't texting back or isn't, you know, doing all the things that would kind of validate a reciprocated interest. And the reality is it's because she's not interested. Because this example and many more like it show you that a woman who's actually interested in a man will tell herself whatever lie that is necessary to sustain their relationship. I saw a meme apparently from Future that said that... Uh, you don't have to lie to women. If she likes you enough, she'll lie to herself. So again, brothers, that girl who keeps leaving you on red, who doesn't respond quickly, who isn't clearing her schedule for you to take her out, my brother, take your business elsewhere. She's not interested. And even if one day she caves, she's going to feel deep down that she's doing you a favor. And at that point, you've already lost because you are permanently in the adorer role. And no woman wants a short man, AKA a man she is looking down at because he's looking up at her. Remember that. You never hear the story about the, the, side, the side dude, right? Yeah. Like the side dude never comes out like, yeah, yeah it was me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you hear a lot of side chicks. Because maybe women get that emotional attachment that men sort of can just disconnect yeah. from. Yeah. Unfortunately, that? I don't think he disconnected that easy, mm. but way easier than myself. Mm -hmm. He knew what it was. He was more logical about it than I was. Mm -hmm. I was ready to leave my baby, leave my family. This was nice. I love y'all. I see y'all on the weekend. I wanted to be with him at all costs. You was ready to leave your kid? I, when I say leave my kid, I mean, here, dad, you can have her. I'll see y'all on the weekend. If this don't work out. She's yours. Just let me be happy with him. That must have felt good. Just to finally get it off of your chest. Just to get it off my chest. Yeah, it felt good. But the pain that I saw in his eyes, that didn't feel good. Because mm. that was my best friend. Mm. That was my best friend. And that didn't feel good. Mm. He, was, he, he was so discombobulated when I told him. He was very upset. He took a walk. It was about four o'clock in the morning because I was out. Why are you out at four o'clock in the morning? I'm somebody's wife and mama got the little baby at home. I was out. When I came in, he was up waiting. And we talked about this little thing he read in the book. I let it go. I couldn't hold it anymore. I was sick. Brothers, just like in business, the person who is the most willing to walk away has all the leverage in the negotiation. She didn't respect him. She might have loved him, but probably like a brother. Even the way she describes it today, he was my best friend. He wasn't her him. And maybe he could have been that to another woman. But more than likely not. Because more than likely, his self-esteem was just as low as hers, which is how they found each other. And at the point where their self-esteems weren't as equally low, these type of things happen. I was being honest. Well, you were still trying to... I was tiptoeing. Right. Because I was like, I don't know what this man is going to do to me. Right. I mean, I know him. Right. But people, you never they know, snap. people snap. And so, I, you know, I was holding my baby because I'm like, he ain't going to kill me with the baby in my hand. I hope. <laughs> so I was holding the baby. And, you know, she didn't know. She's one years old. She's yeah, yeah. two years old at the time. Yeah. She didn't know what was going on. Um, and so I'm holding the baby and, and, and I'm just telling him things slowly. Not everything, mm -hmm. but something. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for him. He comes back in the house and then what? He's like, I'm moving. 
I'm leaving. I'm going to live with my brother. I need to stay there for a couple of days, a couple of months. I don't know. I got to get out of here. Not to, not to, this might sound like a weird question, mm -hmm. but was a part of you relieved when he was? Yes. Because I'm like, I get to be with my boyfriend now. Oh, shit. So a part of me was relieved. I didn't know what it entailed to have my helpmate gone. So I asked him not to leave because I showed, you know, I wanted to show him that I would, you know. Yeah. But a part of me was like, oh, okay, God. well, I get to talk on my phone all night like I really want to. I don't got to hide. I don't got to hide. I ain't got to go in the bathroom texting all night. You know, I ain't got to make up something to get out the house. And now your boyfriend is like, hold on, what you doing? Yeah. He's like, I hope this is not for me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit. no, it's not for you. But, but it's a little convenient. <laughs> it's convenient. But, you know, he's like, well, I still have my kids. And, you know, I still have my girl. He wouldn't call her his wife. It was a lot. Mm. It was a lot of things that I had to break down and tell him. There was a pregnancy he didn't know about, well, he knew about, but he didn't know that there was someone else involved. It was a lot. You were pregnant by the other guy? I think. And when I say I think, it's because I was having an affair. So I was oh, with that guy shit. and my husband at the same time. So I didn't Did know. You, you terminated the pregnancy? So I had to terminate the pregnancy because I just couldn't handle I that. I don't know. I couldn't handle it. I didn't know what, I couldn't go through nine months of torture like that. And then... The baby come and... And I don't know who. Again, part of why it's vital for us to demystify women and divorce ourselves of this fairy tale that we have of who women are is because of things like paternity fraud. Thank God she had the <laughs> morality. I, I don't even know if to call it that, but um, to not go through with the pregnancy, but... Um, statistically, there, there is an uncomfortable number of uh, men who are raising other men's children unknowingly, right? And it's not always because the woman is vindictive. A lot of times she doesn't know. And it's easier to just go with the flow, live in the delusion, than to jeopardize her safe situation. Because the dude that she settled with is typically the safe guy. It's not the guy she wanted, but it's the guy that she knew was going to be a good long-term partner and, a, and a, a good father. But I think, you know, as we continue to demystify women, as women continue to be more honest and transparent, and we can start peeking behind the curtain... I think as men, we could better um, prepare ourselves emotionally, mentally for what it is to navigate women and companionship and love and relationship and marriage. What did he say when you told him that you were pregnant? <sighs> He's like, so you were pregnant by him? You know, he had so many questions. And I had to explain to him, like, I, I don't know. You know, I was seeing him and being with you at the same time. I don't know. But at the time, financially, we weren't ready for another baby. Mm -hmm. And I was able to persuade him that this wasn't the right time. Mm. So my ex-husband, he knew about the pregnancy, but he didn't know mm. that it may have involved someone else. I just persuaded him to like, you know, we just, this is not the right time. You know, I'm on birth control. There could be birth defects, you know, whatever. I shouldn't do this. Let's not do this. And he, he was so supportive. He's like, whatever you want to do. This, this guy is just... He, if I'm you, lying, child, I'm flying. When you, just, <laughs> when you describe him, he just sounds like the ideal guy. What yeah. do you say to the women that are in search of a man like the one you had? Like... That, that they just, don't make them like that no more. Mm. Period. I hate to say it, they don't. They don't make naive men like that no more. And I'm tired of us framing it as a good man. Strive to be kind, not nice. Strive to be reasonable, thoughtful, considerate, intelligent, not just good. Because simply being good gets you taken advantage of. 
And a lot of times that goodness, quote unquote, doesn't actually come from an altruistic place. Sometimes it comes from a lack of self-esteem. Sometimes it comes from idealistic projections of the church or the fairy tale that you have in your mind. Maybe that was put in, into your mind by your single mother making you her perfect man. So no, I think to simply look at him as a victim is incomplete and I think it's overly simple. He participated in his exploitation as well. And I feel the exact same way about women in similar situations. So if a woman is ever that lucky to find someone remotely close, fight for that. You know, stay true to that. If you could be with him today, would you? No. Boom. She wouldn't because she doesn't respect him. And she knows that it's just a matter of time until it happens again. Brothers, a woman who cheats on you is not salvageable at all. Because there were so many boxes that she had to check to even get to the point of cheating. I think especially as a woman, just because of their anatomy, like there's more involved in deciding X person is going to be allowed to enter me than for men deciding I'm going to enter somebody. So by the time it gets to that point and you decide, oh, we're going to make it work, my brother, you're wasting your time. It's, it's dead. It's not salvageable. And even in, in her own admission, he's a good guy. He's a nice guy, just like dudes who end up in the friend zone. But I, I don't want to be with him because ultimately it's about that respect. And she lost it for him a very long time ago, long before she even met the new guy. And maybe it's not because the guy wasn't respectable, but maybe it's because she knows that she's not as good a person as he is. So he's just a constant reminder of her intellectual, or emotional, or moral deficiencies. And it feels a lot better being with a man who allows me to not feel so bad about myself. And the truth is, I was unfulfilled in a lot of ways right. in that relationship. Um, and I wasn't able to express it in the right way. Um, so I was finding my identity through sex. Right. I had this new body and I was getting an identity through sex. He was kind of like the work hoe. Mm -hmm. Every, he had slept with at least four or five girls there from what I heard, right? I wasn't there, but from what I heard, allegedly. And he got you at the right time. He got me at the right time, at my most vulnerable. When my ex-husband served me the divorce papers, mm. that was when I realized I had effed up big time. Why then? Because it was real then. Mm. I never thought, because I, like I said, he worshiped the ground I walked on in a good way. You know, he was amazing for me. So I never thought he would actually go anywhere. Fellas, as good as it sounds, for your woman to think that you won't go anywhere, that you won't leave, she has to have a healthy fear that you could. She has to have a healthy fear that other women would not just be happy to have you, but like are potentially actively seeking you out. She has to think that she won. And the only way to give her that feeling is by becoming a man of caliber in your own right. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need to become a six figure guy before you settle down or whatever the case may be, but like your disposition needs to be admirable. Your philosophical intelligence, she needs to wanna to learn from you. She needs to know that other people admire you for whatever reason, for what you do, for what you've done, for who you are, she needs to know that she's not the only one who finds you attractive physically. And as counterintuitive as it might sound, in the modern day in particular, these things are necessary to keep a woman, I hate to even put it like this, but in line. Because chances are you're not the most handsome man in the world. And even if you were, that's not enough. You're not the wealthiest man in the world. And even if you were, wealthy men are usually the ones who get cheated on the most. So it's about who you are specifically and the uniqueness of who you are. And also, more important than anything, finding a woman who sees value in that. Because around the wrong people, I mean, you, you might never be shit in their eyes. You might never be evaluated properly because they don't even have the know-how to evaluate you properly. So you also have to find the right, 
the right auction block, <laughs> as it were. What's the niche of your relationship now? We're co-parents. We're great co-parents. Good friends. Like I said, he's married, um, remarried, and we're family. We take care of my daughter. We keep her as the focus, and we don't really talk about that anymore. A part of you must want him to be, like, cruel about it, right? And that's the thing, right? So through him, I learned what true love really is, like true agape love. Because after everything I did to him, he is still so kind to me. He, is, he could be such a monster co-parent. He could be such an asshole. He could... I'm blessed. If Kill Me With Kindness was a person, it would be him. To this day. Mm. Till this day, he's super respectful. Doesn't he don't mean. go there with me. Oh. But he don't fuck with me either. Right? Mm. Mm -hmm. If it ain't got nothing to do with my daughter, hey. it's a wrap. He's a sweet person. He's a good friend. We have our little birthday parties, Christmas, and that's it. That's it. It's a wrap. It's strictly business. Strictly business. Very kind. Who do you go back and tell that girl that shows up to the hotel room and says, you know what? We about to take this ride. What, what would you go back to her and say? It ain't worth it. Don't do it. Don't do it, Miss Sealy. <laughs> Don't do it. Run for your life. You'll regret it. That's what I would tell my old self. What would she say back to you? You're right. <clears throat> but I'll be back. <laughs> You're right. But I just one more time. Just one more time. Yeah, yeah. So you would say this is a regret? Definitely a regret. Um, I would say, you know how people always say, if I could go back and do all things over, I wouldn't change a thing because it makes me who I am as a person. Everybody says that. Amen. No, <laughs> I don't feel that way. I feel totally opposite of that. If I can go back and change some things, I would. That's not true. She wouldn't. The reason she wouldn't is because, like a lot of women, she also suffers from Peter Pan syndrome. And a dysfunctional, exciting life is much more appealing than a functional but mundane existence. She didn't like her life before, just like she admitted. It was boring. It was predictable. It was safe. Boring and predictable and safe is not sexy, especially to women with low self-esteem, especially with women with Peter Pan syndrome, and especially with women with uh, essentially a, a midlife crisis, right? She never got to be young and hot. This is her young and hot, and this is the result of it. So no, she wouldn't change a thing. She regrets it hypothetically because she knows she's supposed to, but she's probably dating, having fun, out in the club, doing what she wants to do now. And truthfully, she doesn't want to be married. She never did. She sought marriage because of either safety or to fulfill the desire of her ex-husband or both. Or to fulfill the desire that she thought she had for herself. But she didn't truly want it. And this is true for an uncomfortable number of women. And I think as we go forward into the future, more and more women will start to admit it. We're hearing a lot of women say they actually don't like being moms. Because of the high divorce rate, I wouldn't be surprised if women said they don't like being wives. But they also still like the validation of a wedding and checking off the kid box and a lot of the other social pressures that are placed on them. I am interested to see how this new age of women are received by the world and by men and what new social contracts we're going to have to create for ourselves. If long-term companionship, kids, and marriage is no longer the goal. If he cheated on you, how do you think would, you would have felt? How do you think you would have dealt with it? One. And two, did part of you just want him to have cheated on you too so that you could feel better about what you did? Um, no. Because I'm selfish. I want my cake and eat it too. I want to cheat, but I don't want you to cheat on me. I would have lost it. What? 
I would have lost it. Did this other guy spend money on you? Not as much as he should have. And I'll leave it there. Not as much as he should have. Was it worth it? Hell no. He ain't paid tuition, buy a book, a bag. Do I have a little Gucci bag to show a little Louis Vuitton? No. Like I mentioned, fellas, this 666 stuff, it's, it's cool. It's a good blueprint to kind of uh, understand that hypergamy is real. However, what's also real is the fact that rich men get cheated on the most. <laughs> and very often their women cheat on them with broke men. So it's not that simple. Right? Like right now we're, we're talking about Papoose and uh, Remy Ma. And, you know, she cheated on him with the intern. Because, again, women are feelings oriented. And especially nowadays where they don't necessarily need men for resources in the way that they used to. It's so much more about how you make her feel. So this idea that if you're the guy who spends the most money on her means you're the, you're the guy who's going to win, that's cap. It's bullshit. Like being competitive is necessary, but being the best isn't necessarily, isn't necessary. You just have to be her version of him. And in this situation, again, I know brothers with money who report to me that they spent less money on women after they had money than they did when they were broke. Because again, all these uh, stipulations women put on men, they only enforce it with men they don't like. Let's be real. If a woman really likes you, it don't matter that you're short. If a woman really likes you, it doesn't matter that you're broke. Trust me, I know I was broke. <laughs> and I still got them. If a woman doesn't like, it really likes you, it doesn't matter if her preference is light skin and your dark skin. I've also done that as well. In a lot of ways, human beings are walking, talking contradictions. And I think women are the most quintessential human beings. As flawed and as chaotic and as contradictory and paradoxical as we are, women are the embodiment of that. So it's not just about box checking like some people would lead you to believe. It's ultimately about how you make her feel. How good of a listener are you? Are you charismatic? Are you enigmatic? Or are you predictable? Can you make her feel like she wants to impress you, but not necessarily have to be perfect for you? Again, it's, this, it's these paradoxical things. Because they're examples of, again, handsome dudes who've gotten cheated on, rich dudes who've gotten cheated on, big dick dudes who've gotten cheated on, tall dudes who've gotten cheated on, successful men who've gotten cheated on. So these obvious metrics don't insulate you from bullshit. You first have to evaluate the kind and caliber of woman that you're dealing with, and you have to make sure the experience with you is unique. And it's not just about how you tap dance and perform for her. And very often your unwillingness to, where everybody else wants to, could set you apart. Where are you now? So now um, I relocated to a different state, me and my daughter, and two years ago, and I just started over. Mm -hmm. I'm dating. Mm -hmm. um, and it's different. It's difficult. You know, I got married. It's trash. It's trash. Okay, it's trash. I said it's difficult. It's really trash. Yeah. <laughs> It's definitely trash. The streets. <laughs> it's, it's, it's trash. You're, you're, they say the dating pool has pee in it. I no. say it's straight sewage. It's not in a pool. It's sewer. Sewage. Seriously. Hmm. You know, one, one thing that's interesting about this idea that the dating pool has pee in it, or as she puts it, it's a sewer. It's kind of like I, I saw this, uh, I think it was a meme. And it was like a guy sitting in traffic complaining about the traffic. And then it zoomed out and it was like, he's part of the traffic. Right? So similarly, you're part of the pool. So you're part of the pee. Right? You're part of the sewer. And because of our lack of self-awareness, we don't recognize it. We don't realize often the ways that we are also toxic and we're also unpleasant, and we're also a contaminant. And with her story alone, from the perspective of a guy who might be trying to find a wife, she's the pee in the pool. <laughs> she's the pee, because I guarantee you, she still has that, the same entitlement of a, a bad bitch, quote unquote, a city girl, 
she's still looking for another man to treat her just as well as her ex-husband. And she still feels deserving of it and entitled to it. And is probably committed to putting out as, as little effort as possible to attain that. Because again, what's normal is men courting and men seeking women out and men proving ourselves to women. So for all the people saying the dating pool has P in it, consider if you're the P. You just might be the P. And then you, you're, you're bringing a child into the situation. You're bringing a divorce into the situation. Yeah. You're getting older. All of these things are factors that people are looking at mm -hmm. when dating. So it's like... It's just, it's just blow after blow after, after blow. blow. Yeah. Were you loyal to your side piece? <sighs> Put it this way. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I would say no. Yo. And the reason. You had other flexes. I had other flexes because my side piece didn't behave. <laughs> I'm fucking he crying. He did not behave. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't behave so you, there is no behavior in this situation no he needed to be loyal to what we had going on <laughs> besides his girlfriend and my husband it's me and you and no one else yeah. and so when he would go against that mm. so would I Mm. You know, I would go out with other guys and maybe talk to other guys. Mm. Meanwhile, I'm still married. Mm. Right? So that's a lot of times where the exhaustion came from, too. Mm. I was exhausted. There's no honor among Steve's. No honor. None. None. Hmm. I stand 10 toes down on that. That's incredible how we, you know, did you have sex with anyone else? Yes, I did. It's almost like that person that wins the lottery that never had money, was always struggling. They finally get the money and they act crazy. They don't know what to do. They spend it on this. They get hooked on drugs. They get involved in things they never would have gotten involved in if they hadn't had that money. It's kind of how it is when you lose a lot of weight. Wow. You don't know how to act, especially when you were always big. Best piece of advice I can give you brothers is find a woman who knows how to be bored. That is difficult today because most people don't know how to be bored. Most people are constantly trying to distract themselves from themselves or trying to convince their social media following that they're living a better life than they actually are. But if you're somebody who's still seeking long-term companionship, you want legacy, you want a family, children, a house, a life with somebody, that is inherently going to be predictable and mundane and boring. So if you try to do that with somebody who doesn't know how to be with themselves, it will never work. Just like I said during the uh, ultimatum case study, about Trey and uh, his girl, you'll never be able to entertain her enough. You'll never be able to perform for her enough. You'll never be able to convince her enough because this isn't what she wants. She wants the first few weeks when it's still exciting and hot and there's still novelty. She misses being single, but if you want something long term, something that's inherently going to get boring, you need a woman who knows how to be boring. I mean, knows how to be bored. Knows how to be with herself. Doesn't need constant stimulation or attention or validation. Outside of that, it's going to be next to impossible to make it work because the reality, brothers, is like... All women, I would even say most women are not wives, especially today. Actually, I take that back. Let's not even say especially today. It's just more obvious today. But most women are not wives, just like most men are not husbands. But if you've identified yourself as a husband, be careful in your determination of a woman being a wife. Because this idea that if you're good enough, it'll automatically, magically turn her into somebody that she 
isn't deep down, it's not true. Another thing I'll say about like big women is, um, you know, when we talk about the biblical seven deadly sins, gluttony is one of them. You know, it's overeating. It's being undisciplined with your mouth and your stomach. And then I think there's one for like, you know, sexual deviancy. And unfortunately, there's a lot of overlap there, right? People who are undisciplined with their mouths tend to not be disciplined with their mouths, if you know what I mean. And more than that, if your competitive advantage uh, in competition with other more attractive women is the fact that you put out quicker, maybe you got good head or you got some WAP or because you're a bigger girl, yours is warmer, wetter, whatever the case may be. And also you lack the discipline of rationing uh, things that feel good. It's very easy to have sex addiction. Very easy. So brothers be wary, man. Everything ain't what it seems. The biggest freaks are the quiet girls. The biggest hoes are the big girls. A lot of times the mixed girls, that's a whole nother conversation. The beautiful girls, that's a whole nother conversation about self-esteem versus aesthetics. But again, like pay attention brothers.